I'm going to talk a bit about persistence, career decisions, then the future of technology, the future of work, and then a bit about what we do at Venture Pact. Uh, the best way to reach me is on LinkedIn. That's my LinkedIn uh, email, uh, my LinkedIn address. So just like send me a message. That's the best way to reach me. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to start off uh, by talking about persistence. So persistence is the number one most important thing, uh, in, in my opinion, in business. Because when you look at the reason why companies fail, uh, they'll, say, uh, they'll say many different things. So they'll say, oh, we ran out of money. Or they'll say, uh, we couldn't achieve product market fit. Or they'll say uh, something else. But in reality, it was that they weren't able to persist. They weren't resilient enough to face those challenges and figure out a way to raise money or to tweak their product to fit the market need. And so uh, really it's all about persistence and resilience. So one thing that we do when we're hiring is we have our list of values that, uh, that we uh, hold each, each uh, person we're uh, hiring against. And one of those is, is persistence. And so what we look for is we look for people who expect problems in their day-to-day -day job and think about how to solve them. We want problem solvers as opposed to people who come to us and they start panicking when they face a problem and they complain. We don't want people with negative attitude. We want people with a positive attitude. We want people who know that every day in work you're just going to face challenges. So we want people who enjoy that creative process of solving problems. And if you look at like the famous, uh, famous stories of amazing persistence, there's like the J.K. Rowling who, who had the whole story of Harry Potter and she went to 11 different publishers and everyone was like to her, no, this sucks. And uh, the 12th person, the 12th publisher was like, okay, you know what, we'll give it a shot. And now today Harry Potter is a huge phenomenon and she's made, it's a huge success. But it was because she persisted. That every time she fell down, she stood back up and she kept fighting. Uh, one of, another great story, and this is actually amazing, is Ang Lee. Ang Lee is, uh, he, uh, he's a director, a film director. Today he's super famous and he's done a lot of amazing films and he's won Emmys. But he spent 12 years failing miserably in trying to become a director. 12 years. Imagine every year, like you try to, okay, I'm going to do the next few months, I'm going to try to do this thing and I'm going to hopefully it works. Fail. Fail. 12 years worth of failure. That is amazing. And he kept fighting. And today people just think of him as this amazing film director and they don't understand how much he went through to actually be where he is today. So this is why persistence is huge. And uh, when I think of uh, persistence, I think of the mental, uh, so, so in business or in, in general, uh, when you're, especially when you're an entrepreneur, the hardest thing is the mental dialogue that you have with yourself. You're spending 16 hours a day on weekdays working, maybe 14 hours a day on weekends working, if you try to give yourself a couple hours to do something else. And you're doing that day in, day out for years. And so in your, you're fighting against yourself and your mental dialogue is like, okay, wait a second, am I doing the right thing? There's a hundred other things I can be doing. Is this the right use of my time? And you face so many problems. Everything will go wrong. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong, for sure. That's guaranteed. You're going to mess up a ton of times. Um, and so you, that, that you have to have this level of mental toughness and persistence to deal with all those challenges. Um, so I can't underestimate the importance of persistence. And sometimes, you know, it might make sense to give up if you're doing something you're not passionate about and if you're doing something that, uh, that you, don't, you don't feel is, is the right, uh, right, right, op right option for you. But in reality, it is giving up that causes these things, these things not to work out. So the second thing I'm going to talk about is career decisions. I'm really happy that I wrote an article about career decisions, so I don't have to go into all this detail about it. This is the link to the article. So um, that saves me some time, so I can talk about other things. But um, so you, I, I recommend reading it, because uh, I think there's things that I learned when I was making my decisions. Uh, but ultimately speaking, I, I'll, I'll say this. When I, when I was at Penn, a lot of my classmates would spend four summers working at the same company doing the same thing and then would graduate and go spend two years working at that same company. And their actual exposure to business is very limited and their understanding of what's happening in various industries is very limited. So what I recommend doing is, well this is actually what I did and it's my perspective, but I, you, spend, you should definitely spend one summer working at a startup that has less than 20 people and see how that business is run, how it operates, how, how they grow, because they're going to probably hire at least five people, or maybe uh, they're going to definitely hire over the course of your internship, so you're going to see how the hiring process works. You're going to see how much growth and how much change a company uh, faces, and it's just a completely different environment. So you definitely think you should spend one summer at a company with less than 20 people. 
You should spend one summer with a bigger company that has processes built in, that has structure, to see how these big businesses operate and how they think about the world. Uh, not that it's perfect, but it just like gives you perspective, especially if you're going to build a business that's selling to enterprise, you can see how these enterprises work or, or, or don't work. Uh, so I think uh, that's, that's another good thing. And, and one, another aspect of, so you understand, like these are things you should look for. The third summer, do whatever you want. Uh, and then when you graduate, do whatever you want. But uh, I definitely think you should spend two summers doing that. The, uh, the crazy thing I, I think about career decisions is uh, focus on teams. So you should make a decision based on the team you're going to work with. Because that's going to be your boss. That's going to be the people you work with on a daily basis. So you want to say, okay, who, wh what is, which team am I working with? Who are the people that I'm going to work with on this job? And are they people I respect, admire, and am I going to learn from them? Are they brilliant people that have a good attitude, that I'm going to have fun? Because at the end of the day, if you're not going to enjoy working with these people, if you have a bad boss, I don't care the name of the company you work at, I don't care what the brand is. You care, you, you care about the people you're going to work with directly. And so uh, that's how you should kind of think about career decisions. It's based on team and how much am I going to learn. Uh, you know, if you think about your learning curve, uh, which is the way I'm, I try to make decisions, you want to basically optimize for the steepness of the learning curve. And when you work at big companies, after three to six months, the learning curve becomes flat. It becomes, becomes very repetitive. So it's very hard to sustain that motivation, especially if you're in a bad environment with a bad team, uh, of keep, to keep going. So I definitely think you want to optimize for, for, for learning. The third thing is future of technology. So this is something that I spend a lot of time on. And I can speak hours about this, and I, I don't want to go on for too long. But I will uh, kind of just look forward, project forward into what we see as happening in the future of technology and, and where the world we think the world is going. So the first huge phenomenon is that of 3D printing, which we've all heard about. I, I, I believe we've all heard about it. And, but what does it actually mean? So let's just look at industries and how they're going to completely change after 3D printing. So let's start off with healthcare. So if you can 3D print organs and blood vessels, which actually already has happened, how does that change surgery? How does that change the waiting lists where people wait for these waiting lists to get these transplants, where people have to get cut open to get a kidney from someone else? Imagine if I can just 3D print a kidney. Uh, that's amazing, right? And, and imagine like a 3D print vessels. People are 3D printing contact lenses, eyes. It's completely changed the way we think of healthcare today with 3D printing. Let's look at the jewelry business. So the diamond business is massive, right? Uh, you go buy five, ten thousand dollar diamonds. Imagine if I can just 3D print a diamond for thirty dollars. How does that change the entire diamond industry? Imagine, imagine I, uh, I'm an, I'm, I have an airplane. Uh, let, hopefully, I have an airplane someday. But let's say, let's say an airline, an actual airlines company, they, uh, uh, they, they, have, they have a plane, and the plane has a uh, something's not working. The plane, so they need to get a spare part to uh, to fix that problem. Let's say that that spare part is on an inventory right now at the airport that they're at. So they need to put a purchase order request, wait three months for that I, that that art part to come. The part comes and needs to get installed. Meanwhile, this plane, you're paying parking fees on this plane, right, just to get it fixed. Imagine if I can just 3D print that spare part that automatically fixes it at, uh, at the site, and I'm there, and I just fix the problem. We've already seen 3D, car, 3D printed cars. Imagine you can 3D print a car in a day, right? And one of the most amazing things in 3D printing, which actually hasn't been spoken about a lot, is how it's changed construction. I believe last year there was an example of a house an actual house that was built in 23 hours with a 3D printer. You put concrete into the 3D printer and it printed a house. Imagine how that changes the construction industry. Today when you think of construction, you think of 9 months, 12 month cycles. You think of, uh, you think of tens of millions of dollars to build these buildings. You think of thousands of people and all these construction and zoning laws and, uh, and, and, and getting everything built. And imagine you just put a printer and in 23 hours you have a house. This has already happened. Uh, we re this has already happened. There's a lot of things that need to, get ha uh, need to take place to allow this to come through. But 3D printing is just completely changing the face of the world. Another example. So today, if you look at the clothing industry, retail, how much money is spent on retail? How much money is spent on clothing? Everyone wears clothes, at least in the US. Uh, but so, so imagine if I could, I no longer have to go to a store to buy clothing. You, the, all, all that logistics, all that supply chain stuff, imagine if I just buy a design on my computer, I buy design and I push print and the, clothes is, the clothing is printed. That's 3D printing. Imagine, if already, we already have this happening. She, there was like a woman who did this like 3D printed, like high-heeled, fully customized shoes for women. 
Uh, they, all, everything that's uh, related to uh, retail uh, starts off with women because uh, clo women buy clothing and guys just like, uh, guys are less interesting for, uh, for the clothing industry uh, because there's, uh, fashion is not as important. But that, that's, imagine the, the size of that industry. How will logistics change when I don't need to transport items the way I always have transported items? Uh, let's look at 3D printing food. I'm going to start off. This is my last 3D printing example. I know I've, I've bored you guys with that. But let's look at 3D printing food. Today when you want to buy food, you go to a grocery store, you wait in line, you're really frustrated because everyone's buying groceries at the same time, and you think you're the most important person in the world, and why am I waiting in line, and I should be able to skip everyone else. Meanwhile, everyone else is thinking the exact same thing, that they're the most important person in the world, and why do I have to wait in line, I should be able to skip the line. Uh, but the reason is that everyone works from 9 p.m. to 5, uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and they have to go grocery shopping afterwards and they hate their lives. But imagine if I could just push print and I print groceries. Imagine if I can put print and I can actually print food. It seems crazy, but this is already happening. There is an example of an egg that was printed that works. There is an example of meat uh, uh, that, uh, that's edible. There is an example of meat. It's not meat, but it looks like meat. It feels like meat, but it's actually made out of uh, a green, green product where it's supposedly 80%. It's the company's called Beyond Meat. It's 80% as close to real meat that's printed. Okay, so you guys got 3D printing as big deal. I'm going to move on. So the next thing I want to talk about is decentralized computing. How many people have heard of decentralized computing? Okay, so one person. So the concept of decentralized computing. So today, if you look at the internet, the internet is owned by no one, right? No one kind of owns the internet. But there are a bunch of companies that own properties on the internet, right? So Google.com is owned by Google Corporation, and they, all the data and information on the site is owned by them. If you look at the telecom networks, the 3G that you use on your phone, uh, and the wireless, the Wi-Fi nodes, those are all owned by these telecom providers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. But the idea of decentralized computing is a world where the internet and all these properties are no longer centralized and owned. It's a world where on our mobile devices, we use Bluetooth to create a mesh network. So everyone right now has, a Bluetooth, has Bluetooth on their phone. We can create a mesh network and communicate over our phones our, our Bluetooth of our phones, which creates a mesh network, and now no one owns that. No one can control it. The government can no longer block us, and we become an extension. Our phones become an extension of the actual internet. Our phones become our own routers. Okay, so that's the first level of decentralized computing, which is, uh, which is mesh networks. The second level is called the blockchain. I think more people have heard of the blockchain. Blockchain, one person, two people, okay. So the blockchain is amazing. It is amazing, okay? I think so, at least. So this is the way the blockchain works. Right now, if you want to transfer money, you have to do it through the banking network, right? So I've got to go, to go through the banking networks to transfer money. I've got to do a foreign ex First thing I have to do, if it's international, it takes a bunch of time. I have to pay transaction fees for the transfer. Then I have to pay foreign exchange fees, right? So it's not easy to transact, especially globally. What Bitcoin and what all these cryptocurrency, digital currencies do is they leverage the blockchain. All the blockchain is, is a simple way for anonymous global payments that's routed on the internet. So you run over the internet as opposed to running over banking networks. So no longer do I have to leverage the Visa credit card network or the MasterCard network or banking networks, ACH and all that stuff. You don't need to do that. You just use cryptocurrency. So let me kind of give you guys a sense of, let me give a question. Yeah, but how do you think that like, services like Venmo will affect the adaptation of cryptocurrencies? Okay, so uh, Venmo is a peer-to-peer -peer payments on your phone, uh, but that's actually done with U.S. dollars. So it's, it's a normal currency. It's just doing peer-to-peer -peer payments, which is very different from what Bitcoin does and all these digital cryptocurrencies. These cryptocurrencies are used for anonymous payments as opposed to payments to people you know. Secondly, a cryptocurrency is used uh, a lot for international payments, which on Venmo is very difficult to do because you still have to deal with foreign exchange models. So blockchain, what it is... It's basically, at the very, very simple level, it's a ledger. A ledger, if you, those of you who took accounting will know this, if you, it's basically just like, I, let's say person X wants to pay person Y and wants to pay person Z. The blockchain basically lists X paid Y, Z dollars, uh, and then Y paid A, you know, whatever, B dollars. And it just kind of lists these transactions. And the only, need, the only thing I need to know to make a payment is I only need to know your public key. 
You have a private key which gives you access to your own wallet, your Bitcoin wallet, which is where payments are. But all I need is your public key. And if I know your public key, then I can make a payment to you without knowing anything about you, just your public key. So that's, it's, it's a pretty big innovation and I, it's hard to absorb. It's very hard to explain in, once, in, in a small amount of time. But just think of a world where you have, I'm just going to give you an example of like a purely decentralized computing scenario. So everyone knows the Google car, like it's a driverless car, it's autonomous, it's making decisions on our behalf, right? So the Google driverless car is driving. Now let's look at a network of Google driverless cars all together that are driving and communicating together, right? So I'm going up and there's no need for traffic lights anymore. There's no concept of traffic lights because these cars are speaking together. And they can go really fast at any intersection and they can go, because they know that this car is going to come at this and they know when the car is going to come up and they have all these sensors. Now, let's say I'm in one car and I'm in a rush. I have some sort of emergency, whatever it is. I'm late to a meeting. I need to get in front of that car and I need to get a permit from that car to let me move ahead of it. So then I now ping the car and say, give me your public key. So it's a Bitcoin. They give me their public key. I can now transact. I don't need to know who they are. They're, it's an anonymous payment. I can now pay that person micro payments. You can pay 10 to the negative $20. 10 to the negative 20. So 0 0.0. Uh, 19 times 1, you can pay that small amount of money. So then you can get in front of that car, right? So imagine how amazing that is. Now you can do these payments that you could never have done. Imagine, how, could you, how would you pay someone today? How would you pay another car? You'd have to stop your car, get, either pay them cash, to pay them by card, you have, they have to have square, and you pay them by card, and they now know who you are. Imagine how efficient that is. So the moral of the story is that payments, cryptocurrency, is not replacing cash and money the way we think of it. It is re revolutionizing the way we think of payments, right? So in the 90s, when email was growing, I don't know if you guys remember. So in the 90s, there was the, you know, the whole Hotmail thing, and like Hotmail was growing, and they had that line item under Hotmail that allowed them to skyrocket. And everyone's like, okay, email is going to replace mail. That's what everyone was saying. Oh my God, email is going to replace mail. We all know today that we use email in ways we would never use mail. If you look at every email you receive, a lot of the times, would you have sent physical mail for that same email? You wouldn't. So email has completely changed the way we think of mail. The same way cryptocurrency is going to change the way we think of payments. It's not going to be, oh, we're just going to replace payments we do today with cryptocurrency. You know, another example of leveraging the internet is in the 90s, we used, what is the internet, right? It's like, okay, I'm sending you a message. I'm sending you some piece of information. We take that information and we put it into packets. That packets are then routed over the internet and arrive to you. In the 90s, this guy was trying to speak to his girlfriend, I think in Taiwan, and he was in the US, and he was like, okay, cool. Why can't I just take voice, take voice into packets, and send voice over the internet, voice over IP? And I can now speak over the internet networks as opposed to speaking over telephone networks, which is very expensive. I can now do calls for free. And now we have Viber and all these services that allows you to call, make, do calls over the internet, and they're basically voice over IP. Skype is, of course, the biggest company that does this. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of big companies. Viber is a pretty large company that does this. So this is what Bitcoin and digital cryptocurrency is about. All right, enough of decentralized computing. Third thing I want to talk about is um, artificial intelligence, robotics, deep learning, that kind of era, that kind of group of things. So Google is rumored to be building a robot, okay, that is a humanoid. So a robot that is a replica of a human. And they're supposed to be calling this humanoid Google. And they're going to come out with it, uh, I don't know, a year or two years. We'll see when they come out with it. But it's going to be the closest thing to a human that we've ever seen. And again, this is a rumor, so we're not 100% certain of it. But imagine, imagine what it would take for a robot to function as close as possible to a human. So there are things that a human has, which is creativity and memory. And the way the brain is processed, it's very hard to replicate. Imagine trying to replicate the way creativity in a machine. It's very hard, but we have amazing voice recognition software already, and it's only getting better, right? So now I can process language. The second thing is natural language processing. And you can process, you can take a voice and convert it into actual text and understand it. The second thing is natural language processing. I need to take language, the way humans speak, and under, make sense of that language. Okay, Google's doing a good job with that, uh, and a lot of other companies, Siri and all these things, are trying to make sense of language. So you can start to see that robots are, are going to be are going to be very powerful. And it's going to completely change the way we think of manufacturing. Um, 
there's already uh, limbs and body parts that have been able to make, that, that, allow, that allow you to actually dance. So they've created an artificial limb where you can actually dance. There was a girl who, who lost her right or leg, and they, uh, they, she loves ballroom dancing, so they were able to engineer a, a leg that allows for the twists and the turns of the, of the leg, and they analyzed it. So imagine how far we already are. If you start putting the pieces of the puzzles together, you're going to start to see a lot of innovation in, in robotics, AI, and deep learning. All right, and the last thing I'll talk about uh, is, is uh, machine learning and big data. Oh, that's the second to last thing. I want to talk about one more thing on, on the future of technology. I told you I'm going to spend a long time on this, but it's pretty cool. Um, so right now, everyone has sensors everywhere, right? So there's a concept of iBeacon. Beacons. How many people have heard of Beacon? Okay, good. Three people. Awesome. Maybe four. So Beacon is basically, right now I have GPS on my phone, right? And GPS on my phone tells me where I am approximately. Good enough for me to call an Uber car. What Beacon does is it tells me exactly where I am in a store, which aisle I'm on. It says exactly your location. If I'm in a bar and you're trying to serve me alcohol, you know exactly where I am in the bar. So it gives me very, very granular level location information. And sensors are everywhere. So in a world where sensors are everywhere, you now have insane amounts of data, right? I, if a company is a business, you're trying to take that information and create actionable decisions that are going to help ultimately improve your business. It's not just like, right now it's kind of like, oh, it's cool to get a bunch of data about people. Let's gather all this data. And let's give them these cards and track every transaction they do in a grocery store. Let's give them these credit cards. But in reality, you have to try to think about what does that actually mean for business and how can I make actual decisions. That is big data. That is machine learning. How do I take massive data sets, millions and billions of rows, and make sense of that data? How do I find structure in these massive data sets? And that's what machine learning is all about. So machine learning is going to be huge, and I highly recommend everyone in this class takes a lot of statistics classes. I study statistics, so I'm also biased, but I think it's important, um, especially when you look at, uh, look at the power of, of machine learning, which is kind of like statistics plus computer science. All right, uh, the last thing is Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is the concept of smart buildings, smart cars, smart house, um, and the concept of having 50 billion devices in the next few years that are connected to the internet. Right now, the main devices connected to the internet are your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, and there are a few items that are connected to the internet, uh, like the Nest thermostat and all these things. In the future, everything will be connected to the internet. So that's what the Internet of Things is all about. If your car is connected to the internet, and your, every item in your house is connected to the internet, and your building right now is connected to the internet, um, then you're going to see a world where you have a ton of devices, and your phone becomes a remote control to all those devices. So you walk into your, before you arrive home, your phone is talking to your oven and your fridge. And it's telling your fin, phone and your, your, the fridge and your oven that, oh, Randy is in his car. I just entered my car. I'm probably going to arrive home in 20 minutes because we know traffic. The traffic law, because you have devices in every other car. You know where every other car is located, so you know traffic. So it's going to be like, oh, and it's a Wednesday evening. So I probably want like a meal that's chicken. So it's going to start eating the chicken and it's going to take the chicken out of the fridge and it's going to start heating it. That's the world where you have Internet of Things, where all the items are talking together. We already have the concept, have you guys seen the egg, uh, where you have like 12 eggs, and as soon as you start running out of eggs, there's a, that's connected to the Internet, and it says, oh, there's only two eggs left, probably going to use a few eggs in the next week, let's order from Amazon Fresh more eggs. And you can do that with toothpaste and razors, so all these items are connected to the Internet, so you know when you need your next one, and so you can have subscription, so you can get them delivered with Amazon Fresh. And in the future, you can use 3D printing. I can just print it. I don't even need to deliver it. So you change the way you think of logistics. Uh, and you can think of drones, which is another amazing technology, and how that changes the whole art of delivery. Right now, if you want to deliver items, what, it's just really hard to deliver items in China and India because infrastructure is not great. So Walmart went there and they realized that the cost structure of delivering items to their stores is very different in countries without great infrastructure and highways and roads. So we take this for granted in the U.S., but that's not the case in many other countries. And so if you have drones, then if there's a hurricane, an earthquake, or you're in a country with poor infrastructure, I can still deliver items. I can use a drone if someone, there was, this actually happened, I think, yesterday. So this guy came up with an idea of like, okay, we can use autonomous drones, drones that understand GPS and can actually run on their own, to deliver a uh, fibrillator, right? So if someone has cardiac arrest, you can now, it can trigger, uh, you, can tr you can send a message that will then trigger this autonomous drone to come and provide for you a fibrillator. It will be the fastest ever way to get a fibrillator. 
um, and you can save someone's life. And you can think about that in any specific scenario, right? If there's, a, if there's a city where there's war, if there's a city where there's a hurricane, you can now deliver aid through a drone, regardless of infrastructure problems. So that's gonna, the drones is really gonna change the way we think of delivery and transportation and logistics. Cool, okay, that's future of technology. I can answer questions, I'm gonna stop because I think I've bored you guys enough with what I think of amazing technology, which to you guys might be like, okay, this is, doesn't make any sense. But I think uh, there's some validity to what I was saying. Future of work. So let's look at work today. How does work work today? How does work work today? Okay, so what is work? You wake up in the morning and you put on a suit, you start work at 9 a.m., you go to work, and it ends between 5 p.m. and 2 a.m., depending on where you're at. And what do you do at work? You spend one-third of your time working on the computer, if you're like a white-collar worker. One-third of your time in meetings that you don't enjoy, and you want to take out your phone. Hopefully other people are taking out their phone, so it's not bad for you to take out your phone and mess around, not listen to the people. And then a third of your time on Facebook or social network of your choice, and then you go home. And you're pissed off because you missed your child's piano recital or their soccer game. Uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm sure very few of you guys have kids, but uh, they, uh, in the future, this will actually matter and you'll have a lot of responsibility. So then that doesn't make any sense to business, right? As a business, does it make sense for me to have these people dress up in suits, be frustrated, come to work, spend all their time in meetings and on Facebook, and then be pissed off because they're missing out on all those things. So it's not the best thing for business. For me as, a, for me as, a, as an employee, is this the best option for me? I'm, I don't want to wear a suit. I don't want to go to meetings. I don't want to, so it's not right for me. To, it's not right for the employees. It's not right for business. Why do we, why do we do it? Why have we always been doing it? Because people want to simplify complexity in the world and they want to make simple decisions. So they're like, okay, everyone's doing it like this. Let's just copy them. And that's how we should work. In reality, that doesn't make any sense. And the future work, in my opinion, is all about remote work, distributed teams, and a concept of uh, full autonomy to people. All I really care about as a business is output. I don't care if you arrive at 9 a.m. or 9.02 a.m. I don't care if you're wearing a suit or you're in your pajamas. I don't care if you're in, your, in the office or if you're on the beach. All I care about is your output. That's what I care about. And all you care about is to have full flexibility of your time. So if you have a 2 p.m. parent-teacher meeting, you can go to it without asking for 100 approvals, right? So why doesn't everyone do remote work? The reason is that some companies try it and it fails. And the reason it fails is because, first of all, they're very skeptical in the first place that other work. Second of all, they try to apply the way they think of management and the way they've done management in the last 30 years to remote work without realizing that management completely changes when you do work remotely. So for work, the future of work is about remote working. You have to change the way we think of management. You have to change the way we think of leadership. You have to change the way we think of building culture and companies. Uh, but I think it's very powerful. So that's the future of work in my opinion. Again, this is, all of these things are my thoughts and I agree, I'm sure if there was someone else in the room that completely thinks I'm, I'm you know, talking out of left field and I make no sense, I think it makes sense, uh, but I'm very, very happy to answer questions for people who disagree. Uh, venture fight. Oh, yes, disagreement. Yeah. How would you, how would you like, cope with the social aspect? I mean, if you don't go to, to, your, to your office, yeah. you don't meet your team members. Yes, That's correct. Right. Yeah. Good question. So, right, so people think, uh, re so remote work basically means that you can work anywhere, anytime. That doesn't mean that you never meet your team. So. We are a remote company, Venture Pack, by the way, we're a remote company. We have people, uh, this is our thought. The reason we, because we're like, why should I, I'm gonna answer your question, I just wanted to say one thing. Why should I limit myself, the talent pool that I can hire, to a 50 mile radius from my office, right? Because people have to drive to work or take a subway. So I can limit the talent pool available to me as a company to hire, is 50 miles from my office. But we were traveling around the world to hire, uh, we were traveling around the world for our business, what we do. Um, and we would meet great people that wanted to work with us, and we're like, why can't we hire them? So that's why we started doing remote work, and also we, there's a lot of other things I'll talk about later about what we do. But your question was, how do you meet teams? You now, by the way, as a company, have completely removed office space expense, which is a pretty big expense. All that money goes into travel, and vacations, and trips. So what we do is every three months, each team will meet together in some location of their choice, and all that money is covered by what the office space expense that you had before. And by the way, everyone loves just going to Hawaii for a month and just hanging out, or two weeks. You have no like, creative inter interaction between your employees. That's not true. That's not true at all. So there is amazing technology that's come out that empowers uh, remote meetings and remote, uh, and remote communication. 
So there's companies like Squiggle and Fusebox, and there's a new robot technology uh, where you have iPads that can move around and you can actually talk in real time. You can have do whiteboarding technology where I can do white, whiteboard across three different locations. That's not true anymore. In 2004, that was true. Today, it's no longer true. The communication and internet and, and the, uh, the communication technology available today has completely changed. That's why remote work is relevant today. I agree with you 10 years ago, you couldn't do remote work because imagine if you're on a call and it keeps cutting. But today, that's not the case. And you can build teams. You have to build relationships, build culture. It's a completely different environment. It's not easy. And a lot of the times when we're working with companies and we're talking about remote work, remote work, for, it's very hard for a company with 55,000 people that already have offices to completely become remote. I completely understand that. But when you have hybrid teams where you have some office space, some people co-located in an office, some people that are remote, some people are distributed around the world, some people in different time zones, the way you think of management completely changes. And it's different for completely distributed teams where there's no office where you, uh, versus one office in different distributed teams. There's a lot of different dynamics and does change management and a lot of challenges, you're right. Um, but it's, they are surmountable problems. You just have to want to, believe, want to solve them and make effort into solving them. And it's all about running experiments. You experiment with different things, see what works. Venture Pact. So what do I actually do? I, um, so Venture Pact is basically... Yeah. Great. I like it. Okay, well, my question is, what, is, what would all these futuristic, I mean, 3D printing, which would obviously solve the problems like both hunger and yeah. healthcare, but what would that mean about job markets? Suddenly there is a factory of 500 people that is replaced by one 3D printer. Great question. So let's look at the world 100, maybe 150 years ago. 80% of jobs was in agriculture. Right? 80% of jobs in agriculture. So if you thought about all the technology that's changed the way we think of agriculture, the world adapted. The world adapted and now 1-2% of the world is in agriculture. 30-40 years ago, I met someone whose father was the vice president of electricity in a company. Today, you will never meet someone who's vice president of electricity. Hopefully, you can figure out electricity, right? You just make a monthly payment. And that's all you have to do. You don't need someone to manage electricity and to manage all the problems of electricity. So technology will evolve. And humans are very creative and they will evolve with it. Uh, so I think, I think we, we get caught up in this concept. And I think it's very true that it is going to be challenging for job markets. Uh, but I also think that there's going to be a huge rise in vocational training and a complete change to the way we think of education today. The way we think of education today is we go to a school and we spend four years doing some college degree. We get a piece of paper that's signed in pen, it's in Latin. We get a piece of paper that no one understands. It's in Latin. I was looking at my degree. I'm like, I don't even know what it says. Uh, and then there's a piece of paper that translates it. But whatever. This piece of paper, that's a piece of card that says that I have a degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And that is supposed to be education. In the future, education the whole world, like technology is going to change the world every two years. It's going to completely change. I mean, the phone is only a six, seven years old technology, right? So the world is going to change every two years. So I think there's going to be vocational training, and I think that education is going to change, and I think that people will adapt. But I do think that it's very hard. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to require a lot of effort uh, to do that. I also think that the marginal cost will go to zero of a lot of things. So the marginal cost of food will go to zero. The marginal cost of clothing will go to zero. The marginal cost of a lot of things will go to zero. So in reality, what that would mean is that you don't need to make big money uh, anymore because a lot of things will cost very little. The only thing that's challenging is the constrained resource, which is land and shelter. So shelter will be the biggest problem. Um, but you are going to see more innovation. Hopefully Elon Musk allows us to go to Mars and we just double the, the, the amount of land available. But that's also very futuristic. But I do think that there's going to be a challenge uh, but at the same time, I think education is going to change completely, and the world and humans are just very creative, uh, and they'll figure out a way to completely add value until machines can completely replicate the way the human mind works, which I think will take a very, very long time. So creativity, the human mind, cre the creativity of the human mind is the hardest thing for a machine to replicate, and that's where the difference will come in. Cool. I like it when I when the people challenge because it forces us to think think deeply about these problems. So venture pack, what do I what do we do? So our job is to help businesses better leverage software. So if you look at businesses today, the way they operate internally as a business, the way they serve, the way their employees and all the processes they have internally to do what they need to do, there's a lot that technology can do to improve the way they do that, and there's a lot that technology can do to improve the way companies serve their customers. 
And what we're trying to do is guide them as to what's happening in the world of technology, which is changing very often, and what they can do to better serve their customer, to better operate internally. And so it's a big market and it's a big problem. And what we've done is we've basically created a network of development teams and software professionals around the world and around the country that can serve this problem. And this is why we have to travel a lot to all these different countries, which is a great experience. Uh, and that's why we've met some great talent and we've hired people from many different countries. And um, we work with people in more than uh, in more than 10 cities. But what's amazing is that uh, in, we work internally as an, uh, with employees in more, in more than 10 cities. But uh, we work with uh, companies and we've partnered with firms in uh, in over in over 30, 40 countries. So. Uh, we, cause, so we are not only a remote company, we help other team companies build remote teams. And we think that, uh, we think that by helping companies improve the way they use software and build software, uh, we can make them more efficient and we can make them more innovative and we can think that we think they can better serve their customer, which is better for customers at the end of the day. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna open up to questions. But, uh, thanks for, uh, for us. Alright. Come on. I want people to grill me, go. Yeah, so you talk about uh, everything is connected, cars are connected. Um, how do you think about security? It's a great question. So there's there a few different things there. Uh, one is there's, uh, there's the quad rotor that is doing a lot with security. So then you have autonomous drones that are doing security for you that can scan environments and that can provide security. Like, like more data security. Like how do you make sure that then there's no like data leaks and vulnerability of data in your, in your system. That will Especially with quantum computers coming up, yeah. who just absolutely break every day. So that is always a risk. Um, that is always a risk. Data security is always a risk. Um, and there's a lot of security companies going. Security is a huge area of growth. A lot of companies are coming up in the field. Uh, and it's going to be a lot, there's going to be a huge need for encryption and data security that's going to come up. And decentralized computing solves a lot of those problems, by the way. The whole point of decentralized compu computing is security. The fact is that it's so secure and it's so anonymous that it actually risks bla the black market and the whole economy of uh, transfer of, of Ill illegal payments, uh, drug, the drug economy, prostitution. A lot of that stuff can happen through Bitcoin. So it's very, very, and these digital currencies are, and, and this decentralized computing is very secure. But at the same time, it's, uh, uh, it, it, is, it, it is purely anonymous so that it, it can cause a lot of these illegal things that happen, but I think with every new change, there's a lot of risks and a lot of problems. So security is one of those. So you think that like cars will block each other and there won't be any like, um, network above it managing everything that doesn't exist anymore? Well, it depends on how it's implemented. So it depends on how exactly it's implemented. Uh, right now, Google, uh, the, the, it would be a big problem if someone can hack into your car and, and control the car. Uh, so there has to be, there's a huge, huge emphasis on the importance of security. If someone can do that for your car and your plane, of course, it's a huge problem. Yeah. And if, especially if you look at embedded chips, chips in the body, chips, in, sensors in your body or chip, chips in your brain, that would be a huge problem if someone can control the chip in a pilot's brain. Very big problem. But I think these things are also very much, uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done before these things become unanimous and, and part of the whole world, part of everyone's, uh, adopt, part of, part of fully adopted. Uh, what's your opinion on, I guess going off that question, just our dependence on technology as a society and just the immense progression of that? So, I mean, in 50 years, if, like he was asking, if we have technology running our car, running our highway system and controlling how people are moving around, what happens if that technology collapses at some point? Or there's some point? Yeah. So human error is also a big problem, right? So humans, when they drive, they also make problems. There's a lot of people that die from, from car crash because of human error. Uh, so technology is also imperfect. Technology can also make mistakes. There's also bugs. Uh, so I do think that that's, that, that would be a problem if someone can take, take that over and if there's, if there's a bug in the system. But I think there's, this is kind of part of the game. You know, when people, people think of the Google car, they're like, there's going to be a time when the Google car has a crash. And that's going to be a huge disaster to the Google car. But they don't realize that it's actually much better than what exists today where you have drunk driving. Uh, uh, where you have people who are tired and are driving. Truck drivers that have been driving for, for days uh, on the street. So there will be risks and there will be challenges. But you have to always think about 
that solution relative to what exists today. And sometimes it will be worse. Sometimes it will be better to have a human do something. But then technology will catch up. Most of the time. If it's mechanical. If it's a mechanical thing that you're doing. Driving is very mechanical, right? I switch lanes. I know the route, the route I'm taking. Things like that. Anyway, I want uh, I someone else to give me a tough question. Disagree with the future of work or the future of technology or... Yeah. Do you think this could solve any natural disasters? Do I think this can solve natural disasters? For technology, you know, like in these kinds of technology. I think to solve natural disasters is going to be a different, the solution would be a bit different. Because, so if you look at earthquakes, earthquakes, you have to understand that has to be, to, to solve that problem, you would need something inside the earth to understand how the plates are moving and how you would prevent the plates from moving in the direction they're moving. So I think there would be different solutions to that. Um, you could use technology and sensors to see how they're moving, and you're already seeing them predict very well earthquakes. For them to prevent a movement would require a lot of force and power to be able to control that. It would be very hard. But, I mean, everything, anything is possible. Um, you know, so I think you can see natural that stuff like that, stuff like uh, hurricanes and rain and, and weather, also very hard to control because it's the you look at the the amount of power and energy you have to do to do that is very hard to do. If you look at the problem of aging, um, aging is something we all think of as natural, uh, but if you actually think of aging as a disease that we age and we grow and we look older. And how can we prevent this disease? There's a lot of innovation that's happening in reversing that process. So I don't know how you want to call it, what you would call aging if it's a natural problem or if it's a, uh, but I think there's a lot of people are trying to innovate into how can we completely change the way we think of aging? How can we reverse a lot of the things that happen as we grow older, which is deterioration of the face and the body and the bones? Uh, and with 3D printing, you can do a lot with that if you can re reproduce the limbs, body, uh, organs. So it's still early, though, for me to, to say that. I think it's hard, maybe, hopefully. Yep. Um, I um, used to have an online magazine running for five years, and then I, co I closed it because of uh, a word you said. Um, I'm not too many teams in a re remote work. We were remote working, um, and we had uh, a team problem, and we couldn't solve it. It's very hard. So that's why I want to echo in your uh, comment that it's true. It's uh, difficult when you are in the same room. It's much more difficult when you're in different areas. So I think recruiting, choosing the people for your team is uh, crucial for the. One hundred percent. Remote working has two pieces to it. One is finding the right people who can work remotely, and two is managing the people in the right way. And a lot of the things, the problems that happen is that sometimes people don't know how to recruit properly, even non-remotely. Um, and, some, and then even, even remotely, it's a different way of recruiting. And then managing people is, uh, it remotely is very different. Today, if you look at the way the interview process works, you sit down in front of someone and you tell them, tell me about your strengths and your weaknesses. Okay. Tell me about, you know, are you a good salesman? Yeah, I'm a good salesman. I'm great. How do you see yourself? How, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Okay, great. And, and if you look at the way we do this in the real world, imagine if you have a wedding and you go to a chef, and you, and you know, you tell them, I want, I want a cake for my wedding. Tell me about your strengths and weaknesses as a chef. They'll tell me about, tell me about a time where you face challenge while cooking. You're not going to say that. You're going to tell them, give me a piece of cake, give me a slice, and let me taste it. That's what you're going to tell them, right? So why when we tell someone, uh, when we want to hire a developer, do we tell them, tell me about your strengths and challenges as a developer? Tell them, hey, build this, you want to build some software for us. Here's a task, it's going to take you a few hours, build it. Let's do screen sharing and work together. It's going to be a team, more, a team uh, effort. Let's do that. That's how we do our hiring. But it doesn't make any sense. And a lot of these things with work don't make sense. But we just do them. Every company hires in this way. Um, there are some things, though, that, do, that you, you, I don't want to completely negate the concept. There, there are some things that you ask and you can get some insight in, 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 in normal interviews when you ask questions. You can get insights into things people do. So some people can produce great output, but if they don't fit in culturally with the company, and that's very important. Um, but a lot of the way we do, to, we, we look for the actual skills, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not actually the right thing to do. Because really smart people will know the right answers to questions. The question is, do they actually do the things that they know, that they, that they say they do? So there's a difference there. About this uh, comment, um, you said that um, remote work uh, and teams and individualistic, the third one, the future of work, 
The future of work is going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be global, uh, remote. It's going to be done remotely. There's going to be complete autonomy in your schedule and the time that you work in. And there's going to be, and it's going to be, the, the performance is based on output instead of input. Not did you come at 9 and the other person arrived at 8.58, so that person's better because he arrived two minutes earlier. No, it's what did you produce. How have you added value to the company? And then I'm going to take you because you're better. That is a great question. And that is a very, very hard thing to do. And that's one of the things that prevents people from doing remote work. So the reason is that when people do cross-border work, a lot of the times they think today about cost saving. Instead of thinking about building a team and finding the best talent. And so what happens is people don't build culture. So there's a lot of innovation that's happening. So I can give you a few examples. So right now, you have a culture, uh, there's a few things that happen. You have a water cooler in the office, and everyone goes to drink water, and so you start talking to people in the water, in, in, when you're drinking water. You're in the bathroom, and you start talking to people in the bathroom. Uh, and there's different forced inter interactions that help you build relationships. Um, there's a whole concept of digital water, water coolers. There's products like P2, uh, Word, that WordPress P2. There's products like Basecamp and HipChat. And there's all these things to help replicate that. So it's all about creating a remote culture from the beginning of the company that's going to create these interactions and engagements. Um, so it is solvable, but it needs to be thought of and actively uh, addressed as, a, as an issue. How do we make sure to build relationships? But a lot of the asynchronous communication that is possible over chat is not possible in person. If, someone, if I just spoke to her right now, it would be very impolite for her to respond to me in 10 minutes. If she, but if I sent her a chat message, and she was in the middle of something that was really important, it's okay if she sends me the chat message back in 10 minutes. So that's, that's something that can happen remotely that can't happen in person. And so there's some advantages, but there are going to be challenges with cultural building, and it has to be addressed, and it has to be brought in, and there's a whole, there's a whole research done on it. And the one-sentence answer of the research is basically, instead of doing professional check-ins daily, uh, you do personal and professional check-ins, so you do a personal check-in once a week, and you do a professional check-in once a day, and that personal check-in is talking about what they do and understanding their personal lives, and that helps you build a relationship and understand what they're doing, and it shows that you both care about each other. My question was concerning security, going back to that. Yeah. Um, the 3D printer, the yeah. ability to print a, a weapon that, that happened in, in yeah. the US blueprints were released, yeah. and uh, I know on the internet today there are, there are ways to make bombs and recipes for bombs, but the material is difficult to get. It's a huge, it's one of the risks. So, so it's, it's one of the big risks. There's, everything has risks. You know, you, you know, I still remember the first time I opened a 10K. A 10K is basically a document that, I'm sure some of you already know this, that it talks about the annual report of a company, the annual report. And I think it was Boeing. I was looking at Boeing at the time. And I went to their page of risks. And they had three or four pages of risks. And it made me think like the company is going to go. But they have to talk about every risk. And in every opportunity, and in every new innovation, there's a lot of risks. So security is a big problem. And gun, guns are a big problem. But today it's still very easy to get a gun if you actually think about it. This is from the, state, the States. I'm talking about international uh, level. I mean, in the UK, it's very difficult to get a gun. Most countries, well, the US is a bit different. Yeah. In the UK, I'm talking about Lebanon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one. I don't want to get, I don't, I shouldn't, shouldn't go there, but I do agree with you that, uh, that it's going to be a big problem. Uh, and look, it's going to, if someone really wanted to get a gun today in the, at least in the U.S., they can. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be one of the major risks. I mean, today it's still very expensive to have build a 3D printer. If you look at MakerBot, it's still pretty expensive. Uh, but, uh, but it's not hard. And it's, you, they're going to be one of the well, challenges. You need a blueprint, right? Yeah. And a bit of capital, right. It's going, to be a big, it's going to be a big challenge. I mean, look at drones. Drones, people think today drones, uh, you just think about what are the risks with drones. If someone's carrying my, my, my TV and it's being delivered by a drone, someone can shoot it and it drops and I, they can steal my, my TV. If the, the drone is, you have 10 drones coming up in the same area, you have a plane landing, there's a whole layer of air traffic control now that you have to manage. Because in the past, you just don't, you don't think of one drone, you have to think of a network of drones, what layer they're traveling at, the path they're going at, Planes landing and air is becomes uh, something that people either own or becomes a uh, becomes something that people have to figure out. And, and air traffic control changes completely. Now air traffic control is just making sure planes are within a few miles from each other. 
So but obviously, obviously the, the industry dealing with that. I mean, one, one rogue drone could bring a plane down, I guess. For the uh, it depends on the size of the drone. Uh, to actually bring a plane down is actually pretty hard. But, but, uh, I mean, a bird can bring a uh, Oh, a bird, yes, you're right. If there was a bird, there, there, if a bird can blow, if it goes into the engine, that's very true. Um, it, it, it's going to be a huge, uh, uh, the, the, the need for air traffic control and the need for a full set of laws and governance of drones is going to, need, is going to be necessary to make sure to manage drones. And you're going to have to be able to get a very intelligent uh, levels. So basically what I think of is if you just separate the atmosphere into layers, and you're going you're gonna to have to get some margin for error above and below, depending on the size of the drone. And that's going to be the way we manage the, the air traffic control. And it's going to be an extension of what happens today with the plane at 100x the scale. So, until now, the innovation has mostly been driven by the states, right? But how do you think that, like, the third world, world starts getting them also leading this innovation process? Yeah. Even, like, even Europe, because... Yeah. So I think innovation is a function of the problems we face. So we see a problem and we come and we innovate on that problem. And the problems that are faced in third world countries are very different from the problems today that we face in the US. So a lot of the, the problems in third world countries, right? If I wanted to solve, today if we think of education in a first world country, we think of building schools. If we think of healthcare, we think of building hospitals. And if we think of financial transactions, we think of building banks. That's how we think of it in the first world. In third world, they don't have, it's very hard for them to think of solving those problems that way. So for them, they're going to innovate and think of like, oh, what do I have? I don't have a computer, but I have a phone. So for them, a lot of innovation is going to happen on the phone. The phone is a central device for a lot of the third world countries because they don't have laptops. They leapfrog laptops. They have mobile phones. And a lot of them are feature phones, but you're starting to see a huge growth in smartphones. And there's a lot you can do with feature phones too. And so if you look at the innovation that's happened in money, you know, it started in Kenya. Why? Because Kenya doesn't have the banking system that we have in the U.S. They don't have the same problems we have in the U.S. So I do think you're going to see a lot of innovation in the third world for different types of problems that we have in the U.S. And also Europe is a huge, I mean, if you look at London and Berlin, you have massively growing tech scenes and a lot of interest in innovation and solving problems. So, uh, this is going back to management in this country, because uh, I'm, I'm a graduate student, I yeah. Oh, <laughs> so this is very interesting. This is, this, is your, this is your field, this is what you do. Okay, awesome. Yeah, my question is, how can managers build the management intelligence to lead and work in this uh, innovative uh, culture? How can managers lead well in this innovative culture? Yes. Uh, I think it comes back down to experimentation. Managers need to understand that what they've been doing for the last 30 years, and it's hard for people who have been doing this for 30 years, because they think they get it. And, and, and then you do after you spend 30 years doing it. But they have to understand that they have to build a culture of experimentation. Let's experiment with different management strategies. Let's experiment with different processes to manage people. And let's leverage those experiments uh, and, and test them out, knowing that probably 80 or 90 percent of them will fail. I think that's how you're going to solve problems with management. We, we had a lot of things that were going on because you're dealing with people across time zones. And you have to coordinate with them. And sometimes it's hard to even schedule a call. Uh, so, uh, so there's a lot of things around building process around communication that's going to solve the problem. 90% of organization dynamics comes down to communication. 90% of organizational problems is a communication problem. You have to make it clear to the whole team. This is an experimentation. You have to build a culture in the company that we are an innovative company that aren't, we're not just going to stick to the rules that exist, nine to five, suit, uh, and, and all these policies and meetings. Uh, you have to build, build a culture like, look, we're going to experiment with a few things, but we're trying to change, uh, we're trying to improve and optimize for the company. And that, by the way, is not only for internal operations. The way you serve your customer, you're also experimenting every day. All companies experiment. Google Glass is, a company, is an experiment. Uh, Elon Musk, when he built his first rocket, that was his experiment. So it's all about experimentation. At the end of the day, we don't know that much, right? Customers and behavioral psychology can only take you so far. To understand your customer, you actually have to build an experiment. To understand how people respond to advertisements and marketing and different channels, you have to experiment. So I think experimentation is the key to everything you do from customer service, servicing your customer and internal operations. About this comment, 
like um, I've done my first coaching and consulting last week, and the first advice I got from my professor and colleague who already consulted, buy a black suit and the leather uh, file. That's how uh, they're very... Yeah. I didn't get any advice about the coaching session, so that's how artificial... Right, yeah. Yeah, is. and you know what's hard? You know what's hard in the world of consulting? <laughs> is that you, as a consultant, are going to be perceived because of whether or not you wear a suit. Yeah. And if you go to a Fortune 500 company, you're meeting with a CEO of a company, you're trying to sell them to hire you as McKinsey. If you go in as McKinsey, the way I'm dressed right now, which is the way I go into meetings, and the way I, this is how I dress up to work. If I go in like this, they will either think two things. They're like, oh, this guy's pretty confident because he's coming with jeans. Or they'll think, especially if they're older, they'll go, oh, because this guy's a choke. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the respect they're going to have is lower. So they're not going to hire you. Because first impressions matter so much. Especially, so you have to think about the psychology of the people you're working with. And that's why I think it's really hard to change because it's so ingrained in culture and the way things work that it's very hard for you to change because you know that if you change and it makes sense to you, it's very hard for you to convince everyone else of that. And you're not going to give a lecture that I just gave to every single person you meet with to convince them that you're right. This is why it's going to be hard for it to change. It will change over time. The people in business today who are between 40 and 70, 80, it's going to be hard. The people between 20 and 40 will start to lead that change. It makes sense. It makes sense. No one enjoys wearing these suits and like the tie. Like, what? The tie doesn't even make sense. Like, why am I wearing this, this stick? Like, why, why am I wearing a tie? I don't understand the purpose of a tie. It like chokes your throat and you're like walking around and like trying to loosen the tie up. But I have to wear it because everyone's wearing a tie at, a, at these conferences. And you can't think clearly. <laughs> I don't. I really don't understand why we, we have a tie. And maybe maybe it's a, a it's like a clothing design thing. But I don't know. I don't know. It, it, I mean, it makes it re, uh, you know uh, clothing companies love it because I mean think of jewelry business. Why do we why what's the, why does a girl need the jewelry? Why do they need a ring for a wedding? It doesn't make any sense. Why do what is this? It's just a diamond that shines. But really, there was an advertisement in the 1930s, one of the best advertisements in the history, by Tiffany's, and they said. Oh my God, this diamond ring, this aspirational thing. You should put one month's salary to buy this ring for, your, for, for a girl, woman when you're marrying her. This was in the 30s, and now it's a thing. Now everyone does it. No one knows that it was some ad in 1930 that said that you should buy a ring with a diamond in it. And why do we do it? Because everyone does it. Why do women, but women assign value to it. Why do women assign value to it? First of all, because it's expensive and it shows this love and it's all these things and all these romantic things. Their emotion matters, I give it to you. But the only reason they assign value to it is because one, the diamond industry has done a very good job. Tiffany's did a great, it was one of the best ads in the history of the world because it's completely changed the way we function and the way we do things. But that shows that at the end of the day, uh, a lot of things don't make a lot of sense. And when 3D printing comes out and prints diamonds, which is already happening, when the quality becomes equivalent, then diamonds will become insignificant. If you can buy something for thirty dollars instead of thirty thousand, then it's. But it takes time. How do you three print three D print diamonds? So this is already happening. It's still the quality of the three D printing is not great. So you can three D print organs and blood vessels. It depends on the materials. Organ, I, I, I yeah, yeah, kidney. Yeah. But not a beating or. A beating um, or a well, well. So for a heart to beat, there needs to. There, there's a lot more complicated. But um, there are there are hearts, but they're not three D printed. Um, th that's just very recent though, but they were still optimizing that. The, 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 the organs and blood vessels are 3D printed, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's done, there's different types of materials that you have to put in, so you, you put in. It's tissue. So it's tissue engineering that's used for that. Uh, for, for jewelry, uh, this quality is still not equivalent. When the quality becomes equivalent, that's when you change the diamond industry. Right now, a diamond expert can put a magnifying glass and say that there's some difference in the shining. Just take one, one 3D printed diamond to, to remove the industry. So well, well, yeah, people will always argue that's the difference. You know, with women's purses, they'll say that's a Louis Vuitton $700 bag, that's a Louis Vuitton $2,000 bag, and I know because of the curvature of the bag and the leather and the feel of the leather. But diamonds themselves aren't actually, like, it's just a scarcity. Yeah, diamond is scarcity. Diamond industry is, the diamond industry is a very, very complex industry. The way it works is extremely nuanced, and it is a huge industry. Um, it would be a lot, it would take time to break down the industry, but... 3D printing has the potential too, if you can actually do 3D printing to the quality of that. I don't want to say anything in diamonds because I understand that it's just become a, it's become a part of the world and the culture, right? It's become part, like people don't think, why am I getting a ring? They think I have to because it's valued now by the world. It's valued by the, by the world, so you just, you just do the actions.
It's just, it's hard to change things, yeah. So regarding the transition of, or like the development of technology in more developing countries, do you think the stuff that happened here 20 years ago and the kind of companies that came around here, do you think there'll be very similar kind of companies and uh, similar kind of uh, businesses. internet kind of businesses, companies, uh, Globally. Come, yeah, come into like those specific countries? That's a good question. So what happened in the U.S. is that you've had a huge increase in SMBs, small market, small, uh, small, small businesses. And you see that, I think that's going to happen in most of, the, most of the world. So you're going to see a lot of small businesses. It's going to be very hard to have, to have a Google that captures amazing market share and that comes big. You see a lot of SMBs. And I think that's going to happen in a lot of the global world. And I think that a lot of the things that have happened here, which is people becoming comfortable putting their credit card online, people comfortable putting their credit cards on phones, uh, a lot of those habits will uh, progress in other, in other parts of the world. Um, but it might not be a credit card that they're putting. It might be their public key. It might be different forms of cryptocurrency. Uh, so there will be similarities and efficiencies, just things that are purely make things more efficient. But there will also be different types of innovation in these areas. If you look at India, right, you look at how much it, uh, this agriculture is such a huge part of the economy. Like, agriculture is huge in India, right? Um, so think about, I think more innovation would happen in the agriculture industry over there. Um, if you look at, you know, inf uh, innovation around lack of infrastructure, right? So drones makes a lot more sense and is so much more important in India than it is in the U.S. because of the poor infrastructure. Um, so you'll see different types of innovation because of the different types of problems and different culture also. You serve customers differently when you have a different culture, a different taste, uh, and different types of habits. So there will be differences, but I think a lot of the core efficient things like Uber, I need a car, that's efficient and it makes sense. You're going to see that over there. But then other things like, uh, like Thrillist, which or like the companies that do like the, 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 that give you information around the bar and, and the best bars and how different beers and how beers taste. I don't know if that's as relevant in countries where beer is not like the thing. So. We want to hear about venture life, please. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, what do you want to know? More about what we do? Yeah. Cool. How did you start it? How did you start it? Okay. Uh, so I used to be in, in, in technology investing, and uh, so we would invest in a bunch of tech companies. And uh, before that, I, was in, I worked at the actual tech companies. So having worked at different tech companies and then investing in, different, in multiple tech companies, you start to get perspective, and my co-founder actually had a very similar experience. Uh, to, to different, similar background. And when you see a lot of companies, you start to get perspective as to what are their main challenges. And if you look at their main challenges, a lot of it's around hiring and a lot of it's around software. And so when you look at the software problem in more detail, it's basically um, companies first don't know what's happening in the world of software and how they, uh, and second, they know that they need to be doing something in technology because technology is something that, you know, I need to be innovative and might help me with marketing or whatever. Uh, so what we said was, if we can come in and help businesses with those problems, how, what would it look for us to address this problem? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about the problem and how to solve it. And ultimately we found that what we needed was a network of extremely talented technologists and developers globally so that people can build remote software teams, so people can find great talent anywhere in the world to address the problems that they're facing. Uh, and, and to help, them, so that's one piece, is the execution on the software. The second piece is figuring out what to do with the software. That's internal IP that we built and internal research that we do to figure out, you're in industry XYZ, you're in hotel, you're in hospitality. What are things you can do in hospitality? What are operations that happen in the business of hospitality? How can those be done better? How do you serve your customer in, in, in the hotel? And how can that be done better? And so you start to think of technology and how that can change Industries. What is the next thing that would happen? So implementing technology in today's uh, in businesses, exactly. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And more. right. <laughs> Give, more, tell like, us more about the business. Okay. Uh, so I can talk. To you. So business basically has three parts. The first part is the relationship with the customer. So you have all these customers, all these businesses that need technology, that need help with their technology. The second part is the actual product, which is the online platform where they find, search, and connect with development teams. And there's a lot more nuances there with the RFP process, the management process, the oversight process, the communication process. And the third part is the network of talent and people that we have. So it's all about the pre-vetting and pre-screening all this talent. A lot of the times it's hard to think about screening and, and figuring out how to hire people. 
We have to do that both for our internal business and for our customers, because that's what we do. We hire people. So it is very important for us to travel, and we've had to travel all, in, uh, all around Europe and the Middle East and Southeast Asia to find great talent and learn about the local economy, learn about the local education systems, figure out what types of talent is being produced, what types of skills are people learning, and what types of, thing, and what types of uh, habits do people have in these countries. Uh, to figure out uh, whether or not they're a good fit for our clients. Our clients are mainly based in the U.S. Um, you know, there's some in the U.K., in Europe, some in South America, but a lot of the clients are in the U.S. and Canada. And so are these people ready to serve and work with companies in the U.S.? And how do we help these companies build these remote teams? How many people do we have? How many people do we have? So we have partnerships with, uh, with over 150 suppliers, and we have, uh, above that, we have another few hundred that are, are on our wait list. So in our, on our, in our dev team partnerships, there's multiple thousands, over 10,000. Uh, yeah, probably over 10,000 uh, people on the, on the development team networks that we've partnered with. Internally in the company, we have uh, our core team, uh, we, have our, we have our developer relations team, or our partners team, which do the partnerships. We have a team for the product which is our product management team and our development team. And then we have our sales and services team. And then we have the management team. So. As you saw, you're the CDO. You studied the systems engineering. Systems engineering. So I don't think this is what you do now. And this, you do a different thing now. What do I do now and what did I study? Like, yeah, well, so now we yes, a lot of management. I, I, so I studied statistics, uh, finance, and systems engineering. Uh, systems engineering is about building processes and building systems. So I think of every remote relationship as a system. Every person we hire in all our operations as different systems. And how do I make that system lean and efficient? Um, so how do I take the current way in which we generate leads and serve them? How do you take the current way in which you hire people and manage them? How do you take the current way in the process that people go onto the site? How do you take that system and make it more efficient and optimal? How do you think of the user experience? So I think everything is, can be re relevant to system, and that's why I was interested in systems, because it was very broad and can apply to everything. Uh, what I do today, you're right, is a lot of uh, uh, learning on the go, uh, because a lot of the challenges that we face are, um, are things that I have not studied, or just not like a literature about this specific problem. You just kind of have to experiment, as I've said before, and figure it out. So uh, we pay our employees salary and then bonus, okay. and then uh, there's different types of comp with, with, when it comes to ownership and equity and different types of things. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of complexity. Another compl uh, risk about remote work, which uh, someone uh, probably is already thinking but didn't ask, is payments. If you're hiring someone internationally, there's a lot of laws that, that imply, because you have to give health insurance to every employee that you give, that you work with, you have to provide payroll which is the payments process. You have withholding taxes and different tax laws that you have to deal with with international bank. So there's a lot of complexity around it. Um, so it, is not, it wasn't fun for us to deal with this. But the advantage, it is a fixed cost up front to get it fixed. And then the advantage long term is it makes sense for you to do it once you've figured out how to do it. It's not fun, though. Because we also have to deal with FX. Yeah. You're paying these people. But it's a thriving business. Yeah, 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 you're right, right, you're right. It's, I mean, it takes time and energy and effort to make it work, uh, but you know, things are moving forward. So that's that's the positive side. It's it is a, it's, it's there's a lot of challenges though, uh, every day, a lot of challenges. So there's a lot of frustration and uh, that you have to deal with with processes that don't make sense to you. You just have to yeah. go with it. Thinking about this in terms of like uh, the fact that a lot of U.S. companies like want to hire want to hire people, but they can't hire them because of like immigration laws if they're not US citizens. Yep. So by doing this, you can just like hire someone who's not in the US without even bringing him here. Exactly. Having to worry about like paying exactly. Exactly. money for sponsorship. And all exactly. That. exactly. Why, if they want to live on the beach in Barcelona, right? <laughs> if they want to do that, and the low cost of living is lower, they love it, they enjoy it, they're close to their family, why, why shouldn't they? If they're happy you're there, why do we have to think of the only way they can work with us is to get for them an H-1B, fly them over, the, fly them over to the U.S. and make them work within a 50 mile radius from us. So, yeah. so that doesn't make sense. So you don't pay the people differently according to where they live, so someone working out of, uh, from Abbey will get paid the same as the uh, six one and a half a day? LA versus Bangladesh. Oh, how do we, how you price? Yeah. So I think pricing is on an individual basis. The way we pay is based on someone's experience and what they're committing. 
So, you know, someone has, like, we, we have, like, a, an amazing product, ma product manager with 12 years of experience working on amazing products. Obviously, she's going to get paid more than someone who has two years of experience in uh, some other field. So we pay based on, you know, this, this specific situation and people's preferences for cash versus equity versus bonus, things like that. So we, we tailor it. How do you value the certificates in your recruitment courses? Certificates? Like, yeah. Degrees. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in reality, um, we don't spend that much time on it. So we have, we've found people that have come from Let's see, have we hired anyone? Um, we hired one person that, didn't, that dropped out of college. Um, we, we hire people based on their, uh, the work that they do. On the, so we give them, we tell them, okay, this is a task, do it. How do they do it? We hire them based on what they're looking. So if we enjoy working with someone, if they have the right, so we just have a list of values that matter to us, you know, a sense of urgency, persistence, uh, be people, down, people that are down to earth, people who are positive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we hire people based on those values, and then can they work hard? And, and, can, they, and, can, and can they do good work? Uh, and so the do good work part is through the task, the values is through the interviews piece, um, and, and then over time you, you kind of figure it out. But, you know, if someone has a piece of paper that's in Latin that says that they graduated from university, um, it tells us, okay, they worked hard in high school to get into a good college, um, but we care about how are they today as an employee? We care about are they going to fit in within our culture and can they produce good work? So you would like hire as easily an 18-year-old as a 30-year-old if they have the same... As a 30-year-old? Yeah, so the, yeah, we, do, we do look for... So like, let's say we're hiring someone to run... Uh, let me give you a good example. Let's say we're hiring someone for VP of sales. Okay? So someone to run sales. We need someone with some management experience. And we need someone who has past sales experience. Because you're going to be managing a team of salespeople, you need to understand who they are and how they work. Right? So that's very important. The second thing is, you also need to understand, and, and you have to understand the psychology of the salesperson. Salespeople, is, it's a very tough business, right? It's a very tough job. Because you're always on calls, and you're constantly getting rejected. Every, every time you're doing calls, you're getting rejected. So you have to, and people, you know that there are a hundred other people that are doing calls. So that is important to understand that before. So we look more for relevant experience to what we're doing. If you're hiring an SEO specialist, you want someone who's got SEO experience, understands that. So I think that is more important than someone saying that I have degree X from University Y and I got GPA Z. Some relevant, GPA shows that someone works hard. Uh, that can be important, that's important. Um, but it's different. Like, you didn't woke up one morning and you find yourself successful. So tell us, how did you, <laughs> how did you do it? Um, this is a good question. Uh, you, the amount of times and the amount of challenges and the amount of failures and the amount of things you go through is just insane. And the pain and the suffering, like it feels in the moment, it feels like you just have to have. Um, uh, you, I guess, first of all, the way people define success varies. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, you have to understand that there's so many challenges that you face on a daily basis. Uh, like, we, the amount of problems that you have to deal with uh, from, you know, in the U.S., you have to register to do business in every state. And then there's a bunch of other things that you need to do whenever you hire someone. And then you have health insurance. And then you have payroll. And then if you hire someone internationally, and they want to take ownership in the business, a whole host of things you have to do there. There's a whole system called the Verify that you have to deal with. There's a whole very fun tax system that you have to deal with. The legal system, you have a very a lot of fun writing a bunch of contracts and going through a bunch of terms and projecting us that are not uh, that are not that entertain. They're not that fun. Um, and so you just have to deal with a lot. A lot of stuff gets thrown at you. you. When you manage people, people are, you know, today's world, people are, people have such high expectations. Because, and so, that's, you just have to spend a lot of time and energy figuring out how to manage people, and each person is very different. So there's a lot of challenges every day. And I think, so I think it would depend on how you define success, but I think no matter what you do, expect to just, expect, first, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, and expect a lot of, just problems and issues and just challenges and just expect everything, just really expect everything to go wrong. And just think about how do I solve this problem.
So it's not like, now when something comes, I get an email, it's like, this thing is broken. It's like, okay, cool, I'm not surprised, how do I fix this? Not like, oh my God, it's broken, like, the whole world is going down, and oh my God, it's broken, and I... No, it's like, okay, broken, next, fix it. How do I fix it? That's the first thing I ask, how do I fix it? As opposed to, oh my God, it's broken, let me start just nagging about it. Because there's enough of that. Like, if, you, if I was going to do that, I would do that all day. It's hard though, I, I'm saying this now, and it's easy to just say these words, but every day, over years, it takes its toll. Yeah. So how did you establish your presence internationally? Like since you were based out of here and you were a relatively new company, how did you get, or how did you find people or employees internationally? So we travel to find our development partners. So we just go to a city. The first three days we schedule meetings in advance. The last three days we'd get intros from the meetings we were at the first three days. And we'd spend a week, maybe 10 days, sometimes a bit longer, in a different city. And we would just, we, we, you just go there and you, uh, you just, you know, hope that you're able to get great meetings and get good introductions. And after a week to 10 days, you basically understood the basics. But you were working all day. This like the whole day, from morning to night, you're there, you're in meetings. And it takes, and all that's also very challenging because you're just, you have to be socially on the whole, you're just meeting new people. And there's a whole, you know, there's a just, when you're meeting new people, it's very different from meeting someone you know all the time because then you just, you're talking, you're, you're very comfortable, but you have to get that, get, get, get to that level. There's just, just a lot more work, but that, doing that for 10 days is, is, is how you, is how we do it. And it's a lot of like being comfortable going to people as opposed to telling everyone to go to you because you don't have an office in these places. So you're like trying to figure out the transportation system in countries that have very, very poor transportation system. So, um, and how did you kind of pick and choose these countries? What factor uh, It's mainly on based on the education systems. So we want company countries with great technical education systems and countries with great developer, good developers and countries with strong English foundation. So if they had those three skills, then uh, a lot of the remotes, uh, then it's all about work ethic and, uh, and, and getting them to, to work well remotely. I don't know if you've worked in India. Where else have you? Where else? Okay. Um, so a lot of Eastern European countries. Um, Central European countries, uh, and, and okay, so Central, uh, all of Europe, Western Europe also, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of European countries, uh, Middle East, uh, so Dubai, the Gulf, uh, the rest of the Gulf, uh, Lebanon, um, uh, India, I mean, maybe seven cities in India, uh, what else, seven or six, Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad, uh, Jalandhar, Nah, actually that's fine. Um, the other cities we've been to, but we actually, but Chennai. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's a lot of different countries. Um, I don't know if you want me to name everyone, but it's, it's, it's a decent number of countries and cities. Like, concerning Europe, do you think that's a huge difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe? I'm from Belgium though. Yeah, okay. There are a lot of, of, of like, very good stuff about Aston, for example. About what? Aston. Oh yeah. It's like huge. Yeah. Concerning technology. Yeah. Um, so I do think there's a big difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Mainly in the cost of living is the big difference. Uh, and there's different types of skills. So if you look at Netherlands, Netherlands has strong design skills. They have good English. Belgium has pretty good English, uh, depending on where you are. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm, yeah, 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 I don't want to fully generalize, but like generally speaking, like Germany has great, great solid foundation in English. It's like part of the culture, whereas parts of Spain, they just don't study English. So that becomes harder to hire people there. Eastern Europe, they spend a lot of effort learning, uh, learning English because, you know, if you speak Bulgarian or Romanian, right, that's very few people speak those languages, so you have to learn English. Um, and they're used to working remotely and working with teams globally. Um, so countries with lower cost of living uh, and good environments, uh, where you're living, like in Bulgaria, uh, you can live on the beach. Um, in Romania, it's, there's uh, parts of Bucharest, there's pretty pretty nice areas. So you can live and enjoy and be with your family, uh, and you, it's a lower cost of living, and you can work well. So for them, it makes so much sense for them to work with American companies. What are some of the interesting technology trends, or like some of societal transformation you will in the future and what are some okay. things you need to do to I spent, I spent 50, I spent on my talk, in my talk, I spent a long time talking about this, so I don't want to bore them all, but the list of things was 3D printing, uh, machine learning, decentralized computing, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, and internet of things. <laughs> <laughs>
I can tell you afterwards. I don't want to repeat it because I just said it to everyone, and I've already bored them enough about future of technology. How is your mentality in that your ambitions change since you're sort of our age, and then you've worked through like with the Silver Lake Partners, yeah. and very startup? How did my ambition change? Like your mentality, like yeah. Like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to do it. That is a very, very good question. I don't think I've gotten that many times before. Um, Every three to six months, you just change the way you think entirely about different types of business because you. Uh, the reason, the reason is, I mean, I wouldn't say entirely, but you change a lot of the way you do you do things because the types of challenges and situation you face completely change, right? At the beginning, how do I get customer number one? That's your challenge. When you get your first customer, you think you saw you you're like you're on top of the world, and then you realize that you're no longer on top of the world, and so you basically spend your whole life running after a moving target. So you're never really happy because my first target is here. You achieve it, then you just move your target so you're not even happy. And so you basically just are living in it. It's like a step function. And the level of problems that you face just completely change. And that makes it really hard because you're basically on a treadmill. And, as, as, and when you get better and faster, the speed just goes up. So you're always sprinting, right? And that's, 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 that's how I feel uh, we are. But the sets of challenges when you're running at 15 miles an hour versus 10 miles an hour are very different. Um, the way you would like to raise your knees, and I'm just I'm joking, but so, but the sense of challenges are very different. So, when you have a team of two people, right? Communication is not a problem. Passion and motivation is not a problem because you guys are all you're both founders and you love what you're doing. When you have a team of five people, uh, first you have to, you have to the hiring them is very hard, uh, and motivating them and making sure everything is on peace. The sets of challenges you have are very different because the business is at a very different stage. And then scaling the business, and then building out these teams, and building out the management team, and building out this. So those challenges all change. Um, so I think every three to six months, just rethink the way you think about these things. And I feel that there, in some way, I've noticed this, that uh, there has never been a three to six month cycle where I have, uh, where I have not said, team is super important. So I would say team is super important, and I'd say it's more important than I thought three to six months ago, and I say that every three to six months. So think about how important team is. For it to come back every three to six months, in my mind, team is super important. Because team is number one. Team is going to be the people you're going to be with every day. They're going to build the company. They're going to be future managers. They're going to be the people. They're everything, right? And the team is going to be what drives everything. So that is one example of every three to six months what you think about. You can think a lot about how you manage your, your, your uh, different strategies that you use to motivate, different strategies you use for compensation, different strategies you use for hiring, different strategies you use for sales and marketing. Um, I can go on for a while on this answer, but I just to keep a short answer is that you just really are reinventing the way you think every three to six months because you're in a completely different environment. Uh, a different set of people, a different number of people, a different. Thank you. All right. Oh, okay, cool. Did you ever have to restructure your team? Like, did you ever hire someone that wasn't working at all? And, like, <laughs> how do you deal with how do you deal with problems where it doesn't yeah. work? Out? Um, you'll always you'll always make mistakes in hiring. You'll always make mistakes in everything that you do. Yes. Uh, hiring is one of them. It's all about understanding why it didn't work out, why it's not working out, um, and and Figuring out if it's a problem within the company, the way you're managing, figuring out if it's a problem with a with person and what they're doing, and then seeing if there's any hope, if, it, if they should be put in a different division, or if there's any hope of it working out. Um, and you have to, there's always this conflict of, am I being fair? And am I continuously investing time and energy into something that's definitely going to fail? And plus, you're also investing a lot of time yeah. and money. Is the longer there. And so, um, so this happens, it happens all the time. And it's all about being very strategic and, uh, and honest and transparent uh, about the problems uh, so that you can quickly identify whether or not things are moving in the right direction or wrong direction. You identify a problem, address the problem, see if that address and that communication of the problem is clear. If it's clear, are things moving in the right direction? If they stay the same or get worse, then you give a second notification. Does it stay the same, get worse, or does it get better? If it stays the same or get worse, then it's very clear at that point in time. It's very hard for you to internalize because you've only given them two chances. You know already that it's probably not going to work out. You might give one or two more chances before you finalize and actually decide. Uh, but it's one of the hardest decisions to make because yeah. people's livelihoods depend on you. People who sometimes have families are depending on you for salary. So for you to make a decision like that is not easy. It's a very emotional thing uh, in any meeting where, uh, where you have to communicate something like that. It's never easy.
even after you do it multiple times. The most important thing is to be honest and clear and give them time and, 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 and be, communicate properly as to, look, honestly, this isn't going to work. Uh, how does uh, remote firing work? How does remote firing work? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, remote firing. Okay. So I think the conversations are very similar. Uh, remote firing is definitely easier than in-person firing. Uh, because if you're in-person firing, then uh, there's, you've built a personal relationship with someone, right? If someone's working with you on a daily basis, you have a personal relationship with them, and you're always with them, and suddenly you're in-person and you're telling them we're no longer going to work together. So it's a big change in their routine. If someone's remote, they'll probably get another remote job. Uh, so it's not a huge change in, their, in what they're doing. Um, but it is, it is a challenge. Uh, it's, it's a challenge in both, in both scenarios. I would say it's a bit easier doing it remotely when someone is used to, someone's working on the beach in Barcelona, okay? And then you tell them, I'm sorry, but this isn't working out, and they'll get another job and still working on the beach in Barcelona. It's, it's the last other thing where it's like, I'm going, I'm working with you every day, and suddenly I'm not. Uh, so it, it, it's a bit easier, yeah. It's a bit easier, but it's always going to be a challenge because you're, they're, that income that they had, they're not going to get anymore. Uh, that relationship that they've had, the, 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 so it's never easy, but relatively speaking. I heard that the average age of employees in the um, technology companies is 16 years old. What? Yeah, this is one of, uh, the, the youngest might be 16. Okay, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, is it that true? Uh, uh, 16? <laughs> one six? Well, yeah. Oh, maybe the youngest employee at a company was 16. Yeah. The youngest employee at a company was 16. Uh, the youngest employee we've hired, that's a good question, um, 22, 22, 20, yeah, I think we've employed, we, we hired someone who was 22, I think, that uh, was the youngest employee we've hired. Oldest employee we've hired, uh, if this isn't recorded, I shouldn't say his age, but like uh, in the, in late, late like late 30s, yeah. early 40s, yeah, uh, yeah, like, they're like, we've, we've hired people between How early 20s to late 30s, early 40s. Yeah. How does it to work with someone who's like 15 years older? Uh, who's in the late 30s or 40s? Um, I think, uh, so it's, it's a completely different. When, you're manage, when you manage people who are, have different levels of experience, it's very different. Um, and so it's a different level of, it's a different type of relationship. But you have to, that's one of the things you learn every three to six months. It's how do I, how do you manage someone differently who come with different experiences? Because people come, people are like a pack, people come, and they have this whole set of experiences and thoughts of how the world works, right? And now you're going to come and give them your business and the way you think the world should work. And so for them to absorb and adapt, it's hard. And as someone who's older, it's even harder because they've had a much longer set. It's much more ingrained, right? If you hire someone who's 22, they're much, they're much more easier. It's much more easy to adapt. Whereas someone you hire someone who's, who's 42, and that 42-year-old is going to be like, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. Right? Like, this is how things work. It's like, well, things have changed and in the last 20 years. And so they'll tell you, like, you know, in 1994, this is the way we used to build software. That's changed dramatically. And so they've, that's when they used to code. And so you got it. It's, it's, a, different, it's a different environment. I love it. You guys have questions. I love it. Uh, yeah. this, uh, special. Who's your mentor? Who, who's uh, the people you go to when you have a problem in your world? That's a very good question. You, 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 so the, it's very important to have mentors and people you look up to. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate to have worked. Uh, so sophomore year, this is a story, I won't, I'll keep it short. But sophomore year, I went rock climbing. And when I went rock climbing, I met, uh, I met someone who uh, told me that she had worked at a company in San Francisco. And uh, basically, that uh, long story short, I ended up working for that company. Uh, and the founders of that company are great mentors. They're three of the three of the brightest people. That's why I say team is so important. I worked with a great team. They're my mentors today. Uh, professors I had actually here. There are a few professors that I had here uh, that uh, that are that I speak with and that mentor us. Um, which professors? Uh, so, 